Okay. You think we're on? We are definitely on, although I don't see it on your web on, on your page. Your page, but it is saying that we are streaming live on Facebook. We are we are we are go. I've never been good at Facebook, so. And why do I not see it on my page? Hold on a second. Hold on. Sorry to the universe who is watching right now. Yeah, sorry if you're watching. Oh, here we are. We're there. We're there. We're there. There we are. I see us. So now I can see our questions. Okay. All right. Hey everybody. Good evening. It's Lucy McBride. It's it's Monday, August twenty fourth, twenty twenty, and I'm joining you tonight for a live Q and A with my friend and colleague, fellow internal medicine physician, Dr. Clay Ackerley. Clay, thanks so much for joining me again in our sixth. Q&A with Lucy and Clay. Is this number six? I probably. <laughs> that sounds about right. Think in that sort right. of mid between one and ten, right in the middle there. You know, yeah. <laughs> four, five, six. I don't know. If I had all the time in the world, I might go back and look at our first one and second one and just see like if we see more like knowledgeable now. Hopefully we are now than we were in, you know, whenever we started doing this. Early in the yeah, spring? I mean, we definitely are. I think one thing that is striking over the last number of weeks, and I've talked about this before, is how almost nothing fundamental has changed, right? And so as much as there's still a lot of noise and news and, all right, convalescent plasma came out today with, you know, emergency use authorization. That doesn't change the fundamentals that we still don't know how well it works and what the safety profile is and we need randomized controlled trials. We knew that there was potential there three, four months ago, five months ago from the beginning of this. Um, so I At think we've learned time, a lot, but, I, but it is sort of striking how very few fundamentals have changed in the last number of weeks. Few fundamentals have, 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 have changed. At the same time, we, in terms of like, action items right but but we do know a whole lot more than say we did in the spring and you and i've talked about this quite a lot is, is you know why are the death rates why are people dying less often because of, from COVID, right and i think it's because we know how to treat the sickest patients better we have two drugs that are proven to improve mortality dexamethasone in a big way remdesivir in a more modest way but still proven way and then it's more the younger people who are getting sick, so they're less likely to die. Yes. Yep. Um, and and so so everybody, here we are tonight, Monday night. We are going to um, answer your questions. So just fire away your questions, um, and we will just answer in rapid fire. So while we're getting started and while people are thinking about their burning questions, Clay, let's talk okay. a little bit about what was in the news today, this concept of reinfection. Can you get COVID twice? What are your thoughts on that? So uh, this doesn't seem to be news to me. I talked about this uh, in early July and seeing a patient who got reinfected twice, but there was something newsworthy in the report coming out of Hong Kong, which is you know, my patient and some of the reports that I reported on back in early July, we could not confirm with genetic testing of the viruses that they were two separate strains. So out of Hong Kong, they found a 33-year-old um, gentleman who got it once. They actually got a sample of that virus recently, got it again, sampled it, second strain of the virus. Now, Unlike my patient who got it a second time and got sicker, it does appear that him getting uh, infected again, he was asymptomatic the second time around. Um, so, but at least we've been able to prove in this one case that it is two separate viruses that have infected this patient. It's not clear in the second infection, was he actually expressing enough virus to infect other people? But I think the lesson holds that unfortunately, if you've gone through the process of getting sick with COVID, you still need to be careful. We don't know enough about the immunology to say, okay, based on this antibody level or whatnot, that you are now safe from reinfection. You still have to be careful. Right. I mean, we were hoping back in the spring with the antibody test development that 
people who developed a COVID antibody, meaning the little proteins and soldiers that circulate in your blood after you've been infected that your immune system produces, that that would mean that you had an immunity passport um, <laughs> so that you could go, you know, live life fancy free. But we now know that's not, that's not likely to be the case. But it's also not shocking. I mean, if you talk to enough virologists, immunologists, and physicians, you know, it's not uncommon for viruses to, to not confer robust and durable immunity. And there, you know, this is why we do not have a vaccine for the common cold. But at the same time, there's, there's optimism out there. And I think reason to be optimistic that a vaccine will be able to be developed. What are your thoughts about the vaccine and this idea of being reinfected? What, what does that mean to you? Yeah, I'm not sure. I I am not worried either. So the bottom line is I'm not worried either. I know there are implications, particularly if the vaccines that are being developed follow just the course of a normal reinfection, but or a normal infection. And if you're getting reinfected, if you're just mimicking what a normal infection looks like, well, if you're getting reinfected, then how effective is that vaccine? But even the vaccine doesn't need to be 100% effective yep. to help reduce the amount of community spread. And we will learn. I think uh, Dr. Fauci was pretty clear on this even a month ago. He said, you know, what? when all the data about the antibodies that were waning, you know, out of Spain, out of the UK, he said, look, we can worry about booster shots later. Yeah, let's, <laughs> let's worry. just get some antibodies right now. and maybe non antibody protection. Uh, through vaccines. So I'm yeah. still a vaccine optimist. Let's talk about vaccine for a minute. I mean, you probably know this, um, but I'll just tell our viewers that, you know, I have a hard time convincing people to always get the flu shot. People will say to me, well, it's not 100% effective. And I'll say, well, that's true, but it still does decrease morbidity and mortality, even if it's not 100% effective, even if it's 50% effective. The, the flu um, vaccine in the season of 2018 to 2019, that flu vaccine was only 29% effective. And yet we did the math and it came out to saving 3,500 lives. So that's, that's a lot. So I think- It's not bad. We've got, we've got a lot of, you know, more work to do. I mean, we need more yeah. than 3,500 lives yeah. saved and, 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 but, but it's, 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 you know, that's, that's a 29% effective vaccine that season. So, Absolutely. you know, it's something, and I think, so, so let's talk about the flu for a little, for a little bit. I wrote about it tonight in my newsletter. Um, you know, it's important to get your flu shot this year. We don't have a ton of data on people getting COVID and flu together. There are some cases, of course, in the springtime, um, but it stands to reason that a co-infection, infection with both flu and coronavirus yeah. would be not as good as having just one alone and one alone is not good. So, you know, it's something we can control. It's something we can do is to get the flu shot. Yeah. And I'm recommending everybody get it this year as I always do. Um, I'm recommending you get it whenever you can, you know, bird in the hand when you're at the pharmacy and you don't take many trips out of your house and this is the moment, just get it. Yeah. Um, if you wanna be really strategic about it, um, you might pick mid-October, early October, because we start to see the flu virus circulating in the United States in, as early as October. It peaks in December. Um, but I do think right now, more than ever, we need, a, we need to get people vaccinated. Yep. Totally agree. And I think there's one question that's coming already. Great. Well, I have to admit, when I'm looking to the right, it's, I'm now looking at the Facebook comment section for the first time. Oh, great. Um, and I'm not able to fully track it, but there is a question of when is the flu vaccine available? It's now, now it's not largely available, but you'll find in some CVSs now that, that they do have it in stock. And so, yes, if you get it now, by the late winter, almost certainly the efficacy will have waned. But I think we'll know a lot more about the trajectory of the flu season by then, the trajectory of the pandemic. And so, as you say, if you happen to be by a CVS, you want to get it now, great. Um, there's very little influenza right now. And so the likelihood of you syncing up the maximum efficacy of the vaccine with when you're gonna have the most influenza in the community is not, you know, yes, wait. But then again, get it. If it's convenient for you, you don't have to worry about it. And then come December, call your doctor and say, okay, how are things looking? Should I get a booster? 
Yep. I'm telling my patients the same thing. Let's go case by right. case and see how, see how, see how much more we know in a couple of months. Yep. Absolutely. Um, you know, people say every year, well, you know, I get the flu every time I get the flu shot. I, you know, you know, every, every year I get the flu shot, I somehow get the flu and, you know, it's possible the flu shot cannot give you the flu. Um, you can get flu like symptoms, which is an indicator that your body is mounting the appropriate immune response to fight the real thing when it comes your way. Um, but you actually can't get the flu from the flu shot. So that's. Yep, absolutely. That's, um, but I understand people not wanting to get a shot. I mean, who likes getting shots, but it's not that bad. Um, um, related just to finish up with this, another question. If you normally don't get a flu shot, should you have one this year? Absolutely. Everybody, absolutely. everybody should get one. Everybody should get one. Um, yes, absolutely. With, with, with rare exceptions, but yes. Um, so someone's asking a question about if I'm never leaving my house, aren't I safer than any other year? It's a good question. I mean, the things that we're doing um, to protect ourselves from coronavirus are also protecting us from the flu, assuming you're doing those behaviors. I mean, I think everybody knows at this point that the, 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 the best defense against coronavirus is our own behaviors, wearing masks, distancing, hand washing, spending time outdoors as much as possible, and if indoors, in well-ventilated, non-crowded places. Um, so because flu and coronavirus are transmitted the same way by respiratory droplets, the same things we're doing to protect ourselves from COVID should protect us from the flu. At the same time, we all know that not everyone's doing those. Yeah, and it's just really nice come November, December, when you feel a little bit sick, to be able to tell your doctor, hey, I've had the flu shot. And yes. so, you know, it, it does change how you're gonna be cared for. And I, one person comments, I always get the flu shot by Halloween. Great. I think October is a great time. So, so I think that's a good goal. Yeah. When you, when you said, stock up on your Halloween candy, get your flu shot. Yeah, someone said, you know, uh, the, so a doctor I heard say, you know, I always know to get my flu shot when I see Halloween candy out in the, in the aisles. Well, there's Halloween candy. I mean, it's been out since like <laughs> to July. I think because people know there's not going to be the true Halloween we normally have that the pharmacies are trying to just get rid of it. So anyway, that may be an indicator to get your flu shot in most, most years, but that's fine. That's fine. October. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so someone said, is it too soon to get the flu shot? Not at all. Not yeah, at all. Just grab it. it. Yeah. And do you think public schools will go back this year in person? Okay. Can you switch from the flu shot? Let's go to public. Well, yeah. And this, I mean, the school question and the flu it's kind of go one. hand in hand. So go ahead. No, I mean, I think this, the school question is a big, big question. And I think when you say this year, is it calendar year versus academic year? And I'm quite optimistic that in the spring semester, that will be the case. Testing, we've talked about this a lot with much better access to testing. The community rates will continue to come down. We're fortunate right now in DC that yes, there is a plateau, but it's still coming down. And that makes me more reassured that uh, we'll have enough low baseline transmission that that could be feasible. The challenge that I worry about a lot is what happens as people start congregating indoors and we don't have the ability to spend more time outside. And so, you know, that's sort of in my mind, the big, question mark is once it gets cold, how many cases does it take to then spread? If we're all just huddling back in our own homes, it's no different than it has been or was early on. Right. But if there are social activities where people aren't going and congregating, you're gonna have a lot of you know small you know spreader events. So I've been telling my patients, invest in your space heaters. But now finally the New York Times is taking me up on that. And I think some of the space heaters have been uh, sold out now. If you have any little patio space, how do you try to um, make that you know, winterized so you can have your backyard catch up? Uh, even Martha Stewart's now come out with recommendations on- Oh, Martha. Martha has come out on this topic and talked about like lap pillows or lap, lap blankets and maybe having a stock of uh, gloves and scarves for your guests and things like that. Right, like fire pits and marshmallow roasts Absolutely. all the way until December. I mean, really, yeah. that's, you know, time's kind of cozy. Yeah. I mean, to me, uh, tell me what you think. I mean, I think there, there are a couple ways out of this mess. Um, 
and they could they could happen all in in tandem, of course, and that would be ideal. But one is a vaccine that works, that's not only safe but effective. Um, uh, number two is widespread testing, where we blanket the country with cheap, frequent, rapid tests, so that in real time you know if you're sick or not sick. Yeah. Um, three is. Shall we steal? Shall we steal the the term? And I'm not blanking on who to give credit for, but the the lick a stick. Oh, the lick a stick. Yes. yes. The lick a stick. So once we finally get the lick a stick test you just lick the stick and you see almost like a pregnancy test yeah, yeah. Once we get the that's lick that's stick, what that's what that's what, that's what we, we you and i want what many people want what is being touted by academics and lots of doctors is the way out is this rapid frequent testing um it's not pioneered by michael minna although he's sort of the spokesperson for it up at harvard school of public health so vaccines which you know have promise and hopefully will be around come you know first quarter 2021 widespread testing therapeutics for outpatients so as we you know we have a, a medication called Tamiflu we also have Zofluza these oral medications that are used to treat mild to moderately sick patients with the flu to help mitigate symptoms prevent you know bad outcomes that would be great if we had that for coronavirus right now we only have antiviral treatments treatments against coronavirus that are for hospitalized patients, they're intravenous. Um, and then the other thing, the other way out is, you know, doing the Swedish plan, which is like herd immunity and letting, you know, people just sort of get sick and see what happens, which is sometimes feels like what we're doing now, like a modified Sweden right now. Um, yeah, there was a good article in the, in the, in the, the Wall Street Journal going back, actually, Michael Mena was quoted again, quite, quite often in that article saying, we didn't really have a strategy. We didn't pick a strategy right. of mitigation versus suppression. Meaning suppression is you lock down hard enough to get it out and away. And we never really had that option because it just got too far spread. Versus just mitigation is how do you keep it at a low level, sort of flattening the curve, keep the hospitals open. But, but if you're doing mitigation only, it is still, it's gonna slowly march through the community. Um, but I think, right, sort of on a, on a, on a glass half full side of things, we are buying time for yeah. the testing, right? yeah. for the treatments, for the vaccine. So as yeah. much as it, it fe can feel really frustrating, and I saw one question about like, are you frustrated when you see people not wearing masks? Maybe it depends on the situation. There's certain people who can't wear masks, but I know it's frustrating to see the amount of spread and the amount of harm and the daily deaths and all of that. Um, but it could have been a whole lot worse. And I think we, we have put into place a lot of things we've learned so far to buy time. Um, I'm gonna just say that I think it is r really frustrating to see people not wearing masks. Um, I think there is some confusion about it. I think people, th I think, th which, which, which could be cleared up with some clear, you know, messaging, um, clearer messaging, but I think I think there's a couple of things. I think there's a little bit of confusion about how valuable masks are. I think there's denial at play. I think there is pandemic fatigue. People are like, the hell with this. I've been, you yeah. know, doing the best I can. I've lost my job. I've, you know, my kids are shuttered inside and depressed and I just, uh, the hell with it, which is, I'm not saying that's a good strategy, but that's, there's some of that. And then, you know, I think people just start to think, well, if I don't know anybody who, who who's gotten sick, I don't, know anybody's mother who's gotten sick, then I'm okay, which is yeah. completely inaccurate. So I think, you know, it's hard to keep your foot on the gas all the time and being vigilant. I mean, that's just human nature, but we need to, and we need to continue to buy time because I guess if I was going to bet on a horse of which horse is going to take us to the finish line of like, get on the other side, it would be the rapid testing. Yeah. I mean, that's just my my best guess. Um, yeah, and I think the rapid testing does a lot for a lot of things. It doesn't solve everything. That's right. right? So, so I think what it doesn't solve is for the patients who are truly high risk. It will make the it, it will reduce the amount of spread. It will allow certain environments to open up, say like schools, if you can test multiple times almost practically daily. You know, you have to, I mean, maybe it would be for, for a high risk patient to say, okay, everybody who's coming into my house, <laughs> take the lick a stick and I'm not letting you in until you have that. That is probably more testing than will be available for some time. Um, 
but it will allow for some sense of normalcy, I think. And there was a another sort of comment here about I, I worry that Halloween, I mean, sorry, Thanksgiving and Christmas will be canceled. Well, you know, I think there are a lot of ways to hold on to those things. It just it all depends on how you can define your social circles and That's it. what those traditions look like and how do you hold on to the things that are meaningful to you despite the changes around us. So yeah. I'm I mean, sure. December 25th will still be December 25th. And yes, it may be different and no one wants it to be this way, but it does, it does hinge on, you know, it, we, we all have to just redefine what these things look like. I mean, I think humans need these kind of markers and measures and rituals and everything has been disrupted. So I think it is hard to think about those, those, those traditions being disrupted. But I think if you, you know, if you keep your social circle small, if you have your fire pit out in your backyard on December 25th, even if it's snowing, you got the Martha Stewart blanket all on you, you know, you might be fine. Yeah. Um, fine. I mean, you, you know, you can look to next year and I think things will be so different by then to say, okay, we can go back to the traditions that we're used to, but I think it is important to fight for some normalcy. Yeah. It is, it is stressful and tough as you think about how do we define going into the fall, what are social cohorts and bubbles and what not are. I think it is going to be, you know, people are sort of in the August vacation mode. Some people are gassing up the tank emotionally a little bit because they've gotten away a little bit. Um, but when there's sort of expectations of going back into normal work, when the case rates maybe come down and things begin to ramp up and look more normal, where do you draw that line of saying it's not normal still? And what is your personal level of risk tolerance? And it's going to be really hard and exhausting. It's already been exhausting. I think the next couple of months will be exhausting. And speaking of long haulers, someone is asking here, you know, how do you foresee that we'll deal with and treat the growing numbers of people who get COVID and have ongoing symptoms for months, the long haulers? Well, it's a great question. Um, you know, most people who get COVID fully recover. There are people who have symptoms that last longer as, as we have seen in many other viral syndromes. Yep. Um, and, you know, I think we're still learning what that is. Is it, is it the immune system, sort of like the, 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 the embers still burning of the immune system that needs to be stomped out? Um, I mean, you probably heard, like I did, Dan Griffin talking about giving the, these patients steroids to see if that would help cool off immune Overactivity months after the actual infection, and, and in a couple of cases, it helps. So I think I think we're still learning. Yeah. Um, but again, I think the focus, as as I'm sure the person who wrote you know the question knows, is to just not get COVID in the first place. So not getting yes, COVID. Yes, I think I think so. Prevention is still important. This is yes. a big unknown for those who are suffering long hauler symptoms. I think there is hope. Yes, uh, this is still early. And most infectious disease specialists at this point, even if they haven't set up a formal like long hauler clinic like Mount Sinai, UCSF, and some other academic institutions have publicized their long hauler clinics, most infectious disease specialists are now seeing a lot of this, gaining some level of expertise, and we're going to learn a tremendous amount. Now, I know when you're actively suffering, it's tough to say, oh, I'm just contributing to a knowledge base. Um, but that's at least part of what you're doing. And that learning is going to be, as you note, applicable, I believe, to a lot of other patients who have these sorts of symptoms that have never known why. And we can look back and potentially trace it to other infections. So yeah. I don't think this is going to be particularly unique to COVID. Although obviously with this many people getting this sick this fast, um, we're seeing a lot of them. And there may be something somewhat unique but I have to believe, and I'm optimistic, we're going to learn, learn a ton about how to help other people years down the line from recovering from these sorts of symptoms from other illnesses. Yeah. Um, to me, I don't know if you feel like this, but to me, the end of August and the beginning of September are the sort of like, it's like the new school feeling, even when you're an old person like, like I am, you're younger than I am. You know, I still get that sort of like, feeling of like turning the page and, and the new opportunities in the classroom are ahead and you get your new school shoes and you know, there's sort of like a-, a, a You like a, school a lot more than I did. <laughs> I mean, I, I just like, the, I like the, the turning of the page. I like the autumn colors and smells. And, you know, I think it's hard when we've been in a pandemic 
six months to not have those kind of like rituals in place, like going off to school, buying your school supplies, you know. Which, so which that actually do. reminds me of another thing that people need to stock up on. Yes. And those are lights and reflective surfaces. When suddenly your 7 a.m. walk is now in pitch black darkness, um, or even you know when it gets dark at 4.30, um, we are going to have to find other ways of exercise. I mean, seeing yes. the number of people out there walking, that's great. Exercise is crucial for the mental health aspects of this to support your innate immunity, uh, to help work off some of those COVID pounds that everybody seems to be having these days. Um, but when it gets colder, it's going to be harder to exercise. So uh, I think it's a great point. Thinking through what your winter exercise routine is yeah. going to be and then st stocking up for it is important. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I was getting at with like, the transition, the sort of in, the sort of like watershed moment. You know, we're six months in. Yeah. The news, while it seems fast and furious about COVID, like there's actually not much new day to day that we're learning. Yeah. Um, so I feel like it's a good moment in time for people, if they're willing and able to, take stock of their overall health. Like, how are they doing nutritionally? How are they doing with their relationship with alcohol? And you know, people who are watching might just like throw their head back laughing when they hear that question. Um, how are they doing with exercising? I mean, have they made a routine that's new? The gym's closed, the yoga studio's closed, you know, the exercise bike in the basement has had like pantyhose on it for like six months. Like, you know, do you have a plan? Do you have a plan moving forward? Um, and then how's your mental health? Like, are you connecting with friends? The, the days of the Zoom cocktail hour, remember those back in like March, April, those kind of feel like they've died out, but yeah. but maybe it's worth like, you know, reconnecting with some old friends or, or defining, you know, your small social circle so you can hang outside a little bit distanced with masks and, you know, safely get together. I mean, I think it's a good time to sort of say, look, it's been six months, we're, 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 we're about to head into a new season where we still have a long haul ahead of us. Like, what can I do to optimize my baseline health? Not only so I feel better on a day-to-day -day basis, but so I can actually improve the chances of not getting so sick from COVID and, and just advance the ball in general. Because, I mean, I can picture my waiting room, you know, in June, 2021, right? Like yeah. people who are depressed, anxious, it's like the fallout from like the car bomb, not to like over-dramatize the imagery here, but like, can you pick, I mean, it's, people are going to be I'm depressed. Seeing it, I'm like, seeing it already. Yeah. This is sort of the triad of yes. stress mm -hmm. and anxiety, yep. increased alcohol and mm -hmm. insomnia, right? All of which are tied together and, you know, finding a way to chip away at that is hard. Do it with friends, family, your medical providers. Now is a great time to say, okay, how have I coped the last six months? I should give myself a lot of breathing room and be yes. kind to yourself to say, you know what, this is really hard. How do I just get that strength to give it another six months? And yeah, I do and think the world is gonna be so different in February. I think we yeah. have so much more confidence that the world around us is safer because of testing. That we, you know, that at least our high risk loved ones may have beginnings of access to vaccines, that if they already get sick, treatments will be better. And so I think that the anxiety can come down, you can look towards spring semester and really seeing how schools can open and stay open. There may be bursts here or there of schools trying to open. And I know uh, there's an earlier question about universities and what do we think about that? It's a lot of experimentation and we will learn a lot. I think any school that um, is opening now is sort of its own experiment and we'll learn from it as we think about how to do sort of spring semester really intelligently. But I, but I agree, we are at sort of this turning moment. I love fall, um, so yeah. And yeah, and I think you're right. There's this, there's this you know, natural sort of gravitational pull people have to like the easy quick fixes to mitigate anxiety, right? Like have a drink, like, you know, that is fine as long as you're aware of your relationship to alcohol and you're not overdoing it and then causing insomnia and causing anxiety and depression. So just as you were saying, and, and I echo this, like taking stock of where you are with your sort of fundamental health habits with sleeping, eating, moving, and sort of how are you processing the stress? Like, because it has to go somewhere, right? It's like, 
we all have some sort of stress. Our lives have been disrupted. Our routines have been, you know, shifted dramatically. And some of us have lost loved ones. Some of us have lost jobs. I mean, it's hard to see the kids. Like I, I've got three teenagers. You have a little one as well. It's hard to see the kids, you know, head into a season where where things haven't really changed that much for them and they're doing distance learning. And, you know, we're just all trying to like, adjust to the reality day by day, but it does take a toll. And I think it's good that we sort of zoom out from ourselves every now and then and sort of examine what is it that we can sort of, as you said, chip away at to make our lives just a little better every day. Yeah, absolutely. Um, any other questions? Like someone was asking about transmission versus aerosols. Yeah. I'm happy to answer that. I, mean, I think really? we know pretty well at this point that the primary mode of transmission is respiratory droplets. The droplets that fall around our nose and mouth, you know, usually six feet away from us. There is aerosolization. We know that it happens. But as I say to my patients, it it's just not that likely if you are following the rules of masks, being outside, hand washing, and distancing. Yeah, I think I think the aerosol issue is a real issue for anything indoors. And yeah, I think it's, it's 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 a good thing to remember that aerosols are smaller particles you have to cross a certain threshold of number of viral particles to get actively sick. So, you know, sort of early on, the people who are worried about someone jogging by them, you know, without a mask, should there be, you know, the etiquette of wearing a mask, I get it, but the risk to you of someone doing that is like zero. You're outside. Are they making a small aerosol in that airspace? No, it's going to diffuse. If you walk through and get a couple aerosol particles, you're going to be fine. Yeah. It's the indoor spaces where people are talking loudly for a long period of time where those aerosols can collect that seem to be responsible for some of these super spreader events. Yeah. And so it makes me continue to be nervous about what the plans are for indoor gatherings. But yeah, so there's some element of aerosol spread, but mm -hmm. it's not the primary driver. It doesn't make me nervous that the pandemic is somehow going to change course as long as, as you say, we do the things that we know we need to do. And it, and it's not like measles, which has an R of like what, 18 or 20 or something. A single where, viral particle of measles can get you sick. Yeah. I mean, you can, yeah. if you're it's in a room for like two minutes with somebody with the measles, you, you get it because it's all, it's, it's spread by aerosol. Um, yeah. But, 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 but back to the indoor question, I mean, it's not to say you can't be indoors and be safe. You just have to double down on the risk mitigation measures to protect you from the aerosols, which is about the distancing and the hand washing and the ventilation and the masks. So, and then people ask me every day about the transmission by surfaces, which I think, you know, we've, we've decided is not, it, it, it's definitely not the primary mode of transmission. It definitely can happen, but you know, a lot of the RNA particles, the viral particles that have been detected on surfaces are not in enough quantity to cause infection. And as someone on our favorite podcast was saying, TWIP, you, know, you have to kind of like have someone sneeze on a pizza box like 50 times and then you'd have to touch that pizza box and then touch your face and to get coronavirus. So it's not to say you shouldn't wash your hands and you shouldn't, you know. I continue to wash your hands, but I, I mean, but it provides a level of reassurance. I think the contact mode was pretty scary and unknown. If you're walking to a new environment, where could it be hiding? And yes, continue to wash your hands, but you don't have to worry about that pizza box getting you sick. Yep. Now, I think um, oh, go for it. No, there are a couple other questions and then we'll wrap up because we're, uh, but, yeah. but if, if, if inside with masks six feet apart for an hour, is that aerosol still risk still a concern? Sure. I mean, it's, it's always a concern. Um, Certainly but the, the mask, long... the mask aspect of it is huge, right? I mean, yeah, it's it's, it's it, hugely mitigating, and I think that it, that is sort of getting to the the issue with sort of teaching environments. Um, but like masks six feet apart with good air handling, it all depends on the air handling. And if you're and actually cycling that air out, that is no problem. That's it. Yeah. And it depends on the people you're talking about in that room. If you have two people who just came off a plane from, you know, Arizona in that room, 
Yeah. I'd be a little more concerned than if you had two people in that room who had been quarantining and locked down and playing by the rules for the last six months. Yeah, so but, presuming, what, but presuming one of the individuals in that room has it, right? So it's, it's, one of the individuals you're you're has going it. into the great important math of what's the likelihood of there being someone, that person in that room has it, hugely dependent upon the community transmission, who those individuals are. Who those individuals are. Yeah. But 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 it's not to say that we couldn't imagine going back into classrooms, which are of course indoor spaces, yeah, you know, before we have a vaccine, right? I mean, Absolutely. you can distance, you can hand wash, you can have good ventilation, and so you can try to tack down risk as best you can without it being zero. Yeah. Um, toddlers can be COVID transmitters. I mean, yes, kids can transmit. I think for a while there were people saying that kids can't transmit. There was a, like a New York times op-ed by a physician that was odd that said that they can't transmit. They can transmit. Yeah, yeah, um, I agree. Um, before I lose it, because I can't see the, 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 the questions as I scroll, two yep. really quick questions. One is, if you're 50 years old, should you get an annual medical exam? Absolutely. If you're yes. due for a colonoscopy, should you get it? Absolutely. And there is no better time to do that than right now. I the, totally agree. The rates are going down. We have hospital capacity. I have seen not just the news headlines, which have been there, but many of my patients who unfortunately had missed a window to catch cancer and were dealing with the after effects. After yep. they were due for things in March, April, May, June, and in July and August started getting caught up again. So don't let those things yeah. get pushed off. Even yeah, if you're 49 a... you know, and you're due for your colonoscopy 50, talk to your doctor about getting it done now um, make sure you're up to date on your mammograms, all of your health screenings, and now yeah, because that, those things don't those things don't wait. Unfortunately, or fortunately, our bodies are just you know plugging along, and we got to take care of them. Like you take your car to the shop for you know the oil change and the tires to get rotated. You got to you got to take care of that stuff while you can. Yeah. All right, Clay, let's wrap up. All right, um, and we will do this again. We'll do our seventh Q and A with Lucy and Clay sometime in September, and until then. Everybody be safe, be well, have hope, and we'll see you next time. Absolutely. See you soon. Thanks, Clay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Bye. Lucy. Bye-bye.